I heard this phrase so many times growing up. I think a lot of you did too. I, I think my teachers were trying to get through to me some, something important about life. They would say there's only one thing for certain in life. Two things actually. Death and taxes. We can count on that. Always. Benjamin Franklin actually wrote this in a letter to a French scientist in 1790. He was sharing how they had just formed this country, written a constitution, and he goes, honestly, I don't know if this is going to last. I don't know if it will make it to the 1800s. He he couldn't see there was going to be a civil war that would almost rip it apart, two world wars, a Great Depression. He couldn't see that. But he said, we can be certain there, there will be death, there will still be taxes, no matter what happens. He couldn't see the industrial revolution, the medical, technological advancements that have changed the way we live our daily lives. But, you know, he was only half right. We could be certain of these two things, but Jesus actually adds more to that list of unpleasant realities in this world we can look for. He calls these signs or birth pains. These are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus promises more unpleasant realities will be part of our experience in this world. But birth pains of what? What's being born? The end of the world, Jesus says. People say history repeats itself. I like to say history rhymes. There's nothing new under the sun. The signs and birth pains Jesus will spell out today, you will quickly identify as part of your experience today. But he doesn't just stop there and say this world is going to be unpleasant. He promises that whoever stands with him on the gospel This solid ground he built, he's the foundation, he's the rock, he's the cornerstone. And if we build there and stand there in the gospel, we will endure. He will save us through all these disasters, wars, changes. That's his promise too. He says these things to his disciples. They're talking about deep topics. They're sitting on the Mount of Olives. They're looking across at the Temple Mount. Historians will describe that that Herod Temple, it had gold plates on it. It gleamed like the sunrise. You almost wanted to take your eyes off of it. And the Jewish people just loved their temple. No matter what their stances were on anything else, on the Messiah, on the Word of God, they had different ideas about that, but they loved this building. And Jesus says, you know what? That building you see, not one stone will be left standing on another. He says this decades before the 10th legion of the Roman military marches in, I don't know how they did it, disassembled this thing. You can go there now and see the rubble from 70 AD, a few decades after Jesus promised this would happen as just another one of the signs and birth pains that the end of the world will come, the end of this world. Do you see what he's doing here? He's showing us that anything else we're standing on, placing our hopes and dreams in, trusting in, that's human, is going to fall apart. He promises that, but he promises those who endure in the gospel will be saved. Look where you're standing. We see this all in Mark chapter 13. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. You're going to notice something different about Jesus today than any other influencer, expert, leader in this, in this world that I know of. He's real. He tells the, the truth even though it's hard. He actually says things are going to get worse before they get better. Leaders usually don't want to say that. They want to say, here's your real problems, and I I have the answers to those if you just buy into my agenda and my beliefs, and you support me, and you build your whole life around this. Jesus doesn't say that. He says things are going to get worse before they get better. Many will come and try to deceive you, and of course we know 
there's other religions. Even within the church, there's, there's people that try and change the word of God. But I think it's happening to Christians more subtly today. The false Christs, or even what we make into false Christs, can be really any human leader that takes on a godlike persona in our mind that we think they are the answer. They will fix everything. And, and if you don't believe they're the answer, I can't even hang out with you. I can't stand you. I'm going to unfriend you. I'm going to cancel you. Have some people in this world, humans, taken that place of Christ in our minds? Is that where our hopes and our dreams and our trust is? Jesus says, watch out. Many will try to deceive you. And then he says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. And of course, we could look at what just hit the Appalachian Mountains and the East Coast that happens every year and somewhere in the world. We could pull up maps of the typhoons and the hurricanes. Just The map is just filled with them, right? You pull up a map of the wars and battles that have taken place, that's the history of of us. Jesus is showing us this world is crumbling. It's broken. It is falling apart. Even the things we love most here, he doesn't want us to place our hopes, dreams, and trust in the people here and the things we have here. He has more for us. He has a better place for us to stand. In Psalm 116, the psalmist laments, everyone's a liar. Why should we be surprised when people lie to us? It's the human way. Have we never met another human being? Have we never looked ourselves in the mirror? People tell the stories that work for them. There's only one who does not lie. There's only one who said Jerusalem's going to be destroyed as an act of judgment, as a sign of the, the end of times, and it was in history. There's only one who said things will get worse before they get better. There's only one who's always been there. There's only one who knows the future. There's only one who could remove the barrier of sin that was between us and God, and no trying harder could, could fix that for us. He totally took it away, so you, you already stand with God and his arms around you today. There's only one who could free you from the chains of hell that held you and me and has freed you in in the best sense of that word in a sense that no politician can define freedom the way Jesus does. You are free to be who you really are, who God made and saved you to be. There's only one who transformed death That your death is not the end, but it's when you actually meet Jesus face to face and know him as well as he already knows you now. These are the reformations that need to happen in our minds, that need to dominate our minds and our thoughts in the coming weeks. Where are we standing? Where is our focus? Where are we putting our hopes and our dreams and our trust right now? Because if it's anywhere besides Jesus, it's eventually going to to crumble. There will be darkness either way. Don't let anybody tell you differently. (laughs) You must be on your guard. You'll be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you'll stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you're arrested and brought to trial, don't worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Again, who who says, life is going to be really hard for you because of your faith in me, right? This happened to, to Paul, to Peter, to John. And do you see what's really happening here as they're interrogated, as they're arrested for their faith? Christianity was, was illegal at that time. And they wanted to snuff it out. Get rid of the disturbance, the annoyance. 
Do you see what God's really doing? He's bringing before these powerful, successful people who are, who are filled with pride and arrogance because of their positions. And he's bringing the gospel even to them. It's for them too. And he brings it through people like you and me. I think for us, it, it, this can happen more even within our family and friend circles. Interrogation for our faith. Uh, it's not a topic you bring up at your holiday dinners, right? But why should we be surprised that people don't respect the gospel? Why should we be surprised people are offended by a message that says, you need help, you can't fix yourself, you need to be saved, I have the same problem you do, and hey, we have a Savior, there's only one. That's an offensive message until it becomes real to you and it melts your heart. And so when you're interrogated, when people disagree with you or do not like you, God has the same promise for you as he did for them. The Holy Spirit will be with you. You don't need to retaliate. You don't need to demonize the other side. You respond with gentleness, respect, calmness, kindness. The Holy Spirit has set you apart to be different. This next week, are you going to be known more for your opinions on the here and now, which is human opinion, none of us knows it all, or are you going to be known for standing on the gospel? Which one would the Holy Spirit fill you with and what witness would he have you make at times like this? Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. We know in the early church, family members would rat out other family members for being Christians to get a reward. But it's remarkable to read about how the Christians responded. Just like their leader. They prayed for their betrayers. They forgave their betrayers. They trusted God with the outcome no matter what would happen to them, life or death. You are different. The Holy Spirit makes you different. Here, everyone will hate you because of me, Jesus says. This world is not friendly towards the gospel, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Jesus' disciples were wondering, when will all these things happen? And maybe we are too. When, when will the end come? Faithful Christians throughout history have thought it was during their lifetime because of the state of the world. A hundred years ago, Pastor Diedrich Bonhoeffer in Germany, he was arrested by the Nazis, put in a concentration camp. He was killed as the Nazi regime was collapsing and World War II was ending. And he thought, it's now. The, the way this world has gone was a hundred years ago. Five hundred years ago, Martin Luther thought the state of the church, right, that's supposed to be the refuge and the place of security where, where the truth, where the Bible and the gospel is preached, but it had become a mess, a junk drawer of human opinions and a power struggle. And the state of the world, there were wars and people were just nasty to each other and just living wild. He thought it's now. 500 years have gone by. Jesus says this is not for him to know even, the Son of God. It is for the Father to know. But he does say, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. I think It's a good time to think about where am I standing? What is dominating my thoughts and my mind right now? I think this phrase really puts things back in their proper order. Christians are not citizens of this world going to heaven. Like, oh, that's an afterthought, we'll get there. No, we are citizens of heaven making our way through this world. Remember that your Christian citizenship is primary. It defines you. It's the only thing you really have that's forever and permanent. That comes first and then your duties as citizen of this state and this country fall beneath that. Back in 2016, I'll never forget the dear lady that shared. Just She had been consumed by that election and the way it would go and she said, just for some reason, I just started listening to the gospel more. I started thinking about that more. I started really listening in, in church. 
And I, I paid more attention to that. And it just, it helped with the stress. It helped me not be consumed. It just put me at peace, even if things wouldn't turn out the way I wanted it to. A good friend of mine uh, shared that he had, he had been working in, in a certain industry. Uh, he liked the work. He liked the people. Uh, but all, all it was around him all day was political talk. And he got sucked into it. I remember our conversations a good five years ago. Um, it, it, was, it was different than it is now because that was consuming his mind as the most important thing in his life. And then he, went out, he, left, he left that job, went to a different job. And he's, he said, we've talked about this, I think differently now. I, I realize that's not my whole life. I do my duty as a citizen my responsibilities, and then I leave the rest up to God. It's all in his control. It's, I can only do so much, right? I do my little part, and I leave the rest to God. And it just, it changes our lives if we have that perspective on things. How, how do you take in the news? How do you consume news? And I don't mean which news source do you go to. That's for you to decide. That's your freedom. But what do you do as you're processing the news? I used to struggle paying attention to the news because you could just see through the biases and, and the pull and tug of trying to get you into some tribe of people and then just fill you with their agenda. I started reading this newsletter. A friend shared it with me like three years ago. And it shares the facts. Just the, That's what journalism is supposed to be. Then you form your own ideas. And then it gives a little Bible verse. Now meditate on this truth and go on with your life. And it's been awesome. Uh, this week I shared with my seventh graders this little article about the history of Halloween. And it takes us through pagan holiday, All Saints Day, whatever America's made it into. Hey, let's end with a Bible verse and now let's go trick-or-treating tonight if you want to, I guess. How are you consuming the news? Some of the wisest Christians I know who are just balanced who are just calm even if things don't go their way and don't get so consumed by it. They pray before, during, after. When there's a tragedy, something doesn't go the way they want it to. They pray. It changes how they interpret, how they cope with the things that are out of con- their control, putting in, in God's hands. God will not waste the darkness. There will be darkness either way. These signs, these birth pains will continue until the end of time. That you can be sure of. But those who stand on the gospel will be saved. Stand there. No matter where you've been, if the ground beneath you is crumbling, look up. Your Savior still stands beside you and always will. Endure in the gospel. Amen.